We're delighted that Australia's Treasurer, the Honourable Scott Morrison, is delivering the first of these uh, Gordon Moyes lectures. When the Treasurer and I first talked about this, he was in another role. Uh, but such are, the ways of, <laughs> such are the ways of politics that can change in a matter of hours. Um, I was so pleased that when we reconnected, he said that uh, in this new elevated profile and role he has, that he would maintain the engagement tonight. And we do really appreciate that very much indeed. It's highly appropriate that we honour uh, Gordon Moyes in this way. We thank you, Scott, for being willing to do that. All of us are aware that the Treasurer has previously held some very high-profile uh, portfolios, border protection, immigration, and social security. The federal political career began in 2007, I think, when you took the seat at Cook in Sydney South. And that's all kinds of stories around it, too, I know. Previously, he was the Managing Director of Tourism Australia, and we all remember his colourful signature <laughs> campaign aimed at driving more people uh, to our beautiful country. However, tonight's address is more than just about policy. It's about giving recognition to those areas of life that Gordon was passionate about. I think the link between the, the, the work that, that Gordon did and the work that you believe in as a Christian leader is really significant and important. Um, I think when we, we think of your own life, we see so much of an influence upon it. For the treasury, his Christian faith has been both a compass and a guide in light. The intersection between faith and the public square, the public debate, and all of those things is never an easy one. But it's a place where few people are called, but when they are, it's surprising to recognize just who is in that particular realm. I know you are prepared to have friendships across the floor that is not always recognized. I know at Sydney Rotary Club, which Gordon was a, a past president of, at a meeting last year, you demonstrated your friendships when Jason Clare, the federal opposition spokesman for communications, and yourself, told of the times you go on the Kokoda track, taking young people and, and trying to make a difference and forgetting for a moment that we are Labour and Liberal, but we're for young people. And that really is important. Public life can occasionally be tough, and often lonely. The treasurer has a wonderful supportive wife, Jenny, and I know she's not here tonight, but I want to say that publicly because this place has its special home in your family too, and Jenny's family, of course, are a very real part of our life here. Indeed, much of your early life was shaped by your own father's political uh, engagement, uh, local council politics, leadership in the local church. The treasurer had a close mentor and somebody that made a difference to him. We know that he and his family have gained strength from their faith in the face of many personal challenges, and, and life can be very complex and uncertain. I'm certain the Treasurer has much more to share with us, but let's warmly welcome the Treasurer of, of Australia as he comes and delivers this first lecture as we remember Gordon Moyes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Keith. That was a very generous introduction, and uh, I greatly appreciate it. And thank you so much for the invitation to be here tonight uh, to deliver uh, this inaugural Gordon Moyes Lecture. Uh, to Beverly and the Moyes family, it's a great privilege that uh, you have agreed with Keith's invitation, and I thank you very much for that honour. Uh, Gordon, who I'll speak about more in a second, um, was an extraordinary man uh, of great leadership uh, and of great example. Uh, can I also acknowledge Mark Scott tonight and thank him for being here earlier um, and uh, our prayers and wishes are with him and uh, Bryony uh, as they go through the challenges they currently face. In public life, um, you, you meet many people and uh, you often find people in other jobs and places uh, around the sphere and... Uh, and after a while, when you get to know each other, you, you know that you share a faith in common and, and can often be a great encouragement to one another. And so without doing a roll call on those, um, I, I can say that there is an enormous sense of support and, uh, and fellowship that comes uh, from having those relationships uh, for those of us who, who work in those types of very public roles. Um, can I also acknowledge my own parents tonight, both both my, my own parents, John and Marion, are here, as well as uh, Beth Warren. Roy, I know, would have been here tonight, but he's not well. Uh, but uh, Keith talked about the example of, of my family uh, to me and, and my father always gets the raps. <laughs> uh, 
And I always assure mum that I always say at the same time, in every single interview, mum, I always <laughs> talked about you. And, uh, and it's true. My parents, um, my parents have been such a, a wonderful example to me in their service. Uh, they always brought my brother and I, my brother's a paramedic and senior in the New South Wales Ambulance Service, uh, brought us up to, to, to value uh, what you contribute, not what you accumulate uh, in this life. And uh, I think that's been a wonderful example to Alan and I, which we try and uh, pass on to our own kids. Um, and, uh, and so that's what we try and do. This is a forum uh, which honours the memory and contribution of a great man of faith, of compassion and of community, by gathering together to speak to his abiding interests in life. Gordon's life was dedicated to service and I have no doubt, recently, he uttered those wonderful words we all hope to hear one day, well done, good and faithful servant. He served God and his community and in so doing provided what all leaders must provide and that is an example to follow. As a Christian minister, a social worker and reformer, and a politician, he ventured into all of life's most difficult topics. He was someone who knew, in the spirit of Wilberforce, that the voice of faith, in particular the Christian faith, should not be driven or intimidated from the public sphere. He knew that the separation of church and state was first and foremost to protect the church and the integrity of faith from the direction and influence of the state. He was a great man who had a great heart for our city here in Sydney, despite the fact that he ventured up here from Melbourne. <laughs> the, I was at a function the other night at the Rialto building. I said, it's always nice when they ask me to come and speak at the Rialto building because it has the best view in Melbourne. You can see Sydney from there. <laughs> <laughs> the practical demonstra... Apologies to those who are watching on APEC from Melbourne. <laughs> The practical demonstration of his faith through charity commenced from an early age in, amongst the homeless and downtrodden of Melbourne and it continued throughout his life, most famously through his 27 years as the superintendent of Wesley Mission, uh, bringing hope to those who had not known it and what a tremendous gift hope is. And of course Gordon's passionate advocacy continued through his nine years service as a member of the New South Wales Legislative Council. He was a man of deep heartfelt convictions and our former Prime Minister, John Howard, I think our best, described Gordon, Gordon as the epitome of Christian leadership. Gordon was also a man who prized results. He understood business and always came to the table with a healthy serve of common sense, meted out liberally. Uh, he could be as hard-headed as he was kind-hearted. And Wesley Mission benefited greatly, but more importantly, many thousands of vulnerable Australians across our country, and especially here in his beloved city of Sydney, were the primary beneficiaries of his love and care and grace. And in coming here tonight, I also particularly want to acknowledge the continued wonderful work of the Wesley Mission, and your long history, as we've just seen, 200 years of caring for the most vulnerable. And Keith, um, they were very big shoes to fill, but they're fitting nicely, mate. They are fitting nicely. <laughs> I wanted to talk a bit about our welfare system tonight and that is what Keith and I first uh, discussed when some months ago and we thought about how we could uh, best honour Gordon. Our social safety net is understandably and as it should be a source of great pride for Australians. It is one of our most important institutions. It reflects the strength and generosity of our society, our belief in the fair go and our determination to help those in genuine need. Uh, but few would deny that it could be better targeted and that it needs to be more sustainable economically. Only this way can it be a safety net that Australians can really rely on. And you need no more recent example than what we saw in Greece to illustrate that point, a safety net that was killed with kindness and good intentions, which no one can now rely. I remember very vividly the image of the elderly Greek man sitting on the street in tears in Athens as what he thought would be there for him in his retirement and his old age was no longer there. Uh, since the coalition was elected, we have set about the task of ensuring a strong budget, 
because a strong and balanced budget supported by a strong and growing economy is crucial to having a sustainable safety net. Otherwise, it's just unfunded empathy. And we have been about the task of controlling our budget to ensure that the resources we have to support the most vulnerable are as targeted as they can be. In undertaking this task, we have sought to place need above entitlement. But the challenge is vast. Right now, the government spends one third of its budget on social services, some $154 billion every single year. That's more than twice the size of the New South Wales state budget. It takes around eight out of 10 income taxpayers to go to work every day to pay this bill. And this bill will increase by $73 billion in the next decade annually. Largely a result of the growing demands in areas such as aged care, disability, care and childcare systems. Meanwhile, since 2004-05, we've seen expenditures double for job seeker allowances and age and disability pensions. And this is why we seek to implement Australia's next great social reform, the National Disability Insurance Scheme. And the government is fully committed to this. The reality is, though, that from 2019-20, the, the half a percent increase in the Medicare level will cost less than half, sorry, will cover less than half of the Commonwealth's contribution. By 23-24, about $32 billion will need to come from consolidated revenue. Now, the NDIS should be the first dollar, the very first dollar we spend out of our social services budget. It is a program that invests in people's ability. It is about assisting people to be as independent as they possibly can be, regardless of their disability, to help every Australian, regardless of their level of ability, to realise their potential and to be as independent as they can. Now, of course, we will commit to this and we will meet our commitment. But it will mean that we must ensure that our welfare system more broadly is targeted and fit for purpose. The system has some 20 payments and 54 supplements now, making our welfare safety net a complex and unwieldy system. Most disappointingly, the complexity and coverage of the welfare system can serve as a disincentive to being in work. The best form of welfare is a job. Yet in 2012, last time this statistic was properly calculated, in 19% of Australian families, 19%, almost one in five, no one had a job. That means that more than 530,000 Australian children, age under 15, were growing up in a family where no one had a job. The intergenerational implications of this statistic are chilling, and it was the most disturbing and haunting statistic that hung over me each day I was in the social services portfolio and remains over me today. Almost 40% of children who grow up in a jobless family, if they remain welfare dependent by the age of 22, will remain welfare dependent. And we must do better than this. This is robbing young Australians of their future and of their life and of their potential. That said, that said, there are bright sparks there are bright, optimistic things in front of us. There were fewer working age Australians receiving input, income support, as the chart shows, in, two th in the most recent year, in 2013, uh, sorry, 2015, than there were in 2008. Uh, and that's currently, uh, which was around about 16.3% at that time. And so you have to go back to 1990, as you can see there, it's the blue line I'm referring to, to show that we are making progress as a proportion of the working age population. And uh, at the same time, our workforce participation, which is, uh, which is not strictly the red line, that's employment to population ratio. But the employment to uh, population ratio of the workforce uh, age uh, population has increased uh, in more recent times. You can see the kick up there in the most recent year up to... Uh, uh, 72%. Now that's reversing a decline off the back of the GFC, which is the top point of that red line there, of uh, over 73%, where it fell from. So we are seeing as a proportion fewer Australians, uh, thankfully, now being income support dependent of working age, and we are seeing more Australians actually getting themselves into work and choosing to participate. Uh, last week, when the employment figures were brought down, youth unemployment is now at 12.2%, and it's far too high. 
but it's down from a peak of 14.5% in November 2014 and down from 12.6%, which is where it was at the time of the last election. Some 35 odd thousand net extra people, of uh, young people, are now in work since the last election, which is something we're very pleased about and we would like to see those numbers continue to climb. More than 360,000 jobs have been created since the last election, with around 315,000 of those in the past year alone. Once again, the strongest employment growth in seven and a half years, and more than 10 times the job growth rate than was occurring in the year of the last election. A job provides dignity, purpose and self-worth. It delivers economic opportunities and helps to break the cycle of poverty. It provides choice and the ability of Australians to exercise some control over their lives. Everyone who can work should work, because welfare cannot do what a job can do. Ronald Reagan used to say that the government can do a lot of things to destroy families, but it can't do anything to replace them. And the same is true about a job. Welfare cannot replace a job. It can only mitigate the loss of income. The welfare system can catch you when you fall, but it must do more to help people bounce back. We can do this, of course, by working with the sector, and I acknowledge Lynn Hatfield Dodds was here this evening from Uniting Care, and many of you others will be here tonight, I'm sure. And we need to think innovatively about how we do this. We need to welcome choice and, and build in sustainability to how we do things. And tonight, I was going to touch on a couple of particular areas, including superannuation and how we can pursue these objectives. A better welfare system frees up people to enter and participate in the economy. Uh, meaning more people working, which means stronger growth in our economy. You've all no doubt heard the word fairness being used particularly regularly over the past few years. It's always very much in the eye of the beholder, in the context of the political debate on the budget and welfare spending more broadly. Many, particularly our opponents in politics, are, are quick to invoke the word to justify their views that Australian people uh, should have more of their income taxed and spent by a government on higher levels of welfare. But fairness, I believe, in Australia is not so much about income redistribution, but it's about a fair go. It's not about an equal income for everyone, but an equal opportunity. Our welfare system is an economic stabiliser, not an economic equaliser. It provides a targeted safety net for those who need it, when they need it, and for as long as they really need it. But our safety net must act to restore, not enslave. It must signpost as effectively on the way out as it clearly does on the way in. Now, that means we need to tax in a way that minimises negative distortions in our economy, such as penalising self-sufficiency. In other words, to back people to follow their natural instincts to get involved and participate in our economy. We're currently involved in a debate around the tax system. Well, what we're trying to simply do is remove the impediments that are holding people back in the tax system and back the people who are out there every day working and saving and investing for their future and who are asking the question, where's the government? Are they backing us or are they hindering us? And we're out there seeking to back them and have a tax system that does exactly that. So we need to tax in a way that engages everyone to make a contribution and to share in our great national task of this wonderful country, but also to let people keep as much of what they earn as possible. There are two ways you can get, an, you can get a pay rise. You can get one from your, your employer and you can get the other one from the treasurer when they cut your taxes, your income taxes. And I, I am keen to give Australians that sort of support, uh, but that requires changes to be made to ensure that we can sustainably achieve that. Making payments, handing out government checks to people can condition our population to welfare and state dependence. Better to take home what you earn than what you were given. When Labor was last in government, they increased the income tax-free threshold from 6,000 to 18,200. This meant up to one million people, on their estimates, would leave the tax system. Meanwhile, as of June 2015, these are the absolute numbers, around 5.1 million Australians received an income support payment. This is an increase of 10% from 2000. That's right across, not just working age population. When 4.69 PM received income support payments back in 2000, that means more than 400,000 additional Australians receiving payments. So around a million going out of the system 
as a result of that change and some 400,000 coming onto the payment system. Now, we need more people to understand that the answer to our economic circumstances is a job and not welfare, and our tax and welfare systems must support that understanding. And while that we have already acted to reduce the number of supplements in our welfare system, and we have outlined plans to do more, and, uh, and currently have those measures before the Senate, the complexity built into our current system means that they are laid on top of a framework of rates and eligibility and activity testing and compliance, which is quite confusing. And under these circumstances, people in similar circumstances can have dramatically different experiences of income support. And that's not how it should be. It needs to be easier for people to understand and access support, and there needs to be a clearer pathway. Of course, the government understands that some intricacy is necessary, given our welfare structure is highly targeted. But this has to be balanced against the benefits of simplicity, which will also make the benefits of work to people clearer. A more streamlined system, one that has addressed anomalies in the payment architecture, would go some way towards removing administrative inefficiency and high operating costs. Take the example of two students. One is on Oz study and working to complete a full-time graduate diploma. The other is a youth allowance job seeker completing a full-time short course. Both are looking to improve their skills and secure employment. Both, however, are treated differently by the income support system. The student on Oz study who is regarded as having fully met their mutual obligation requirements with full-time study, can access the Student Income Bank. This allows them to accrue more than 10,000 work credits a year, meaning that if they choose to work, they can keep more of what they earn. The student on Youth Allowance, on the other hand, has to look for and accept any paid work that doesn't conflict with their study. And if they do secure work, they can accrue up to 1,000 work credits before their support payments are docked. Now, this is the type of situation we do need to avoid. Uh, the system shouldn't cause students or other Australians receiving income support to hesitate before accepting work. Now, I highlight those circumstances not to prefer one or the other of the options, but simply to highlight that our system teach, treats people of basically doing the same thing differently and is changing the incentives available to people because of the complexity. Another example of complexity occurs uh, by obscuring the benefits of work is high effective marginal tax rates. And what that means is as you choose to work and as your payments change, you're actually better off on welfare than you are on work. Now, that isn't, um, th that is rational behaviour. Some people say, well, why have they chosen to do that? Because the system is actually producing that result. I remember being on 2GB, funnily enough, uh, with Ray, and uh, he was, this was a quieter interview. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, but he was relaying to me the story of, the, of a woman who I think was receiving around $1,000 a week in various payments. And she said, well, why would I work when she was doing... When I, if, I'm, if I'm earning that already, why would I go to work? And I said, well, I don't disagree with her logic. I disagree with the fact that she's saying she was earning that money because it was being provided by the taxpayer. But people will, react, will, will behave rationally in these circumstances. And uh, it is up to the government to ensure with state and territory governments, that these systems do not have these inbuilt disincentives. So while we talk a lot about the tax system at the moment, it's actually the combination between the tax system and the welfare system that is critically important about changing a lot of the dynamics of what's happening. So the effective marginal tax rates becomes a problem where income support recipients are subject to a number of different income tests at the same time. The complex interaction between these tests can mean a person actually loses money by increasing their hours of work thereby choking their opportunity for advancement. A two-child family receiving family tax benefits, for example, when one of the kid leaves, kids leaves secondary school and says, and say, applies for youth allowance, the family becomes subject to two income tests. This means their effective marginal tax rates increase and the overall assistance for the family drops. As much as possible, withdrawal rates across payments should be coherent so people transitioning between payment types are not subject to a sudden drop in income. Now, I appreciate this might all be terribly technical, but these were the sort of very practical issues that Gordon understood and would see the outcomes of this every day on the streets of this city. And these are the things that in politics and in public policy need to be addressed so that the, if you like, the bottom of the cliff responses that are so often co kindly, kindly and generously provided uh, by organisations like Wesley are not drawn on as heavily. 
and we can avoid those outcomes wherever we can. Sadly, it can't be done in all circumstances, and that's why the wonderful work of Wesley will always be necessary. But we don't need to make their job harder. So through simplification, we can make it easier for families to understand the clear benefits of getting back into work or working more, and we need to have the settings for work incentives and expectations right. And that is what I think is the fair thing to do. That's the simple thing to do. And with steps such as this, we can encourage more people into work and to work more. In the brief time I have remaining, two other areas I'd touch on briefly. One is a thing called the investment approach, which uh, when I was social services minister, we adopted in the last budget. And this is a very refreshing approach. And it's taken from our, our, our Kiwi cousins across the, the ditch. Uh, one that uh, <laughs> highlights, we're allowed to joke about the Kiwis, they beat us in the rugby. So. And we're all very passionate about cricket and netball now, aren't we? <laughs> uh, ones that highlight what, uh, what, what, what this does is it highlights the innovative thinking that it can happen in, in the government sphere. It looks at the safety net from a completely different approach, stressing the need uh, for it not only to protect it but restore people. And when it was introduced in New Zealand to reduce long-term welfare dependency, uh, direct, it directed funding where it will do the most good through the most innovative means. Uh, under such an approach, you start by using actuarial analysis to assess the risk factors for long-term welfare dependency. And this would allow them to pinpoint those cohorts which are likely to benefit from early intervention. Now, the best example of this is when they went through and looked at, well, who's in our welfare system? Who's receiving payments? Um, young people, particularly young women, were amongst... There wasn't a particularly large cohort within the overall group. But they found that if you went on to welfare when you were between, I think, between about 15 and 19, you had a habit of staying on it for the rest of your life. And so if you're able to int introduce interventions in those early phases of, of, of someone's life, in those critical years, you've massively reduced your long-term welfare dependence over the course of their life. And they used this early intervention model. And uh, it is already showing in New Zealand from the work that the actuaries have done uh, by allocating 20 million, sorry, by allocating the monies they have into those particular areas that is, re that is resulting in billions of dollars of savings for the welfare system over time. Now, we've invested $20 million in the last budget to apply the same actuarial model um, adopted for, adapted for Australian conditions uh, into this system and to use that as the appropriate planning tool for how we design our, our public policy interventions. And it puts a very strong discipline on those interventions. Um, in, in government, you get a lot of people that come and tell you and say, this will work and this will change everything and all the rest of it, and they'll produce a, a, a document from, from some accountancy firm somewhere which has a list of assumptions which are longer than the report. Um, but uh, the way we are looking at it is to ensure that we have the, the reliable model which can assess the actual impact. And that puts a real, um, a real performance criteria on those seeking to use public money. Um, being sincere about it is, is tremendous. Uh, being right about it is even better uh, because it does get the result for the person who is standing right in front of you that you're seeking to help. And we need to use those dollars as best we can because there is not an infinite supply. And a dollar we spend in an area that doesn't get results is a dollar robbed uh, from where it could have a very, very big impact. The other area is one that was very dear to uh, Gordon's heart, and that is community and business partnerships. And in this area in particular, um, we have become very interested in the issue of social impact bonds, where my colleague and friend Mike Baird, the Premier here in New South Wales, has been taking a very leading role and uh, through initiatives such as um, the new PIN bond uh, with Uniting Care Burnside, partnering with Social Ventures Australia to deliver a child protection and parent education program. Now, from memory, they were getting a return of around 7.5%. 8.9 now. now. It's gone up. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. Now, this is tremendous. This is tremendous. Private investment in solving a social problem, which saves the government money, and as a result, we share the benefits of that save with the private investor, and the private investor brings a new discipline to how many social enterprises work. Um, our social enterprises are, are not short of compassion and energy and passion and all of these things. They have that in bucket loads. Uh, but what the private sector investment can often bring to these enterprises is innovative ways of doing things, efficiencies and, and various other ways of ensuring they can meet the targets that they so earnestly want to achieve. And so I commend Mike Baird for doing it. And when you look around the world, there are stories across the globe uh, Canada 
the social benefit bonds are being used to help single parents in Belgium. It's giving unemployed migrants uh, a leg up in Ireland. It's changing the lives of homeless people, as it is also in South Australia, where the, the Labor government there has introduced a, a social impact bond um, with common ground. Now, in the final area I wanted to touch on tonight was superannuation. And it plays a significant role in welfare reform. And our retirement income system is underpinned in large part by the age pension and superannuation. Now, the age pension is the ultimate welfare safety net. It provides security for those Australians who, for whatever reason, have not had the opportunity to save for their retirement. Superannuation, on the other hand, creates independence in retirement. It also means greater security, and over time, it will reduce the reliance on the age pension. That's the point, by the way. We have tax incentives for superannuation to ensure that those who are at risk of being on the age pension are able to go into their retirement as, as independent families and couples and individuals. Um, that, that is the whole reason you do it. I mean, in this country, we have a private contribution scheme uh, for retirement incomes. Uh, the age pension is not a contribution scheme, as occurs in, in Europe and other places. Um, people pay taxes in this country not to secure a pension. They pay taxes in this country to contribute to the general services and, uh, of government that are provided over the course of a lifetime. Of course, some of that obviously goes to supporting the age pension. Uh, but we do not have a contributory scheme, an insurance-style scheme, that exists in many other places. Uh, that, is our, that is done through our superannuation scheme, and we have a welfare safety net payment, which is the pension. Now, when we look at superannuation, and you think of where we want to end up, which is when people get to retirement age, that they be independent, there are many in our community who will go through very different pathways to get to that end result. And I think one of the weaknesses of our superannuation system is it assumes largely a one-size-fits-all, that everybody's going to have the same journey, that no one's going to have any interruptions um, to, the, to, their, to their working life or, or, or life circumstances. And sometimes they may bring great benefits and other times they may st might deliver the most savage of blows. And uh, the, the lack of, of choice and flexibility over the course of people's working lives in how they build up superannuation, I think is an impediment that is holding back people back from being independent in their retirement. Um, I have described independent um, self-funded retirees as heroes of our economy, and they are, because it's what we should all aspire to. We should all aspire to be independent. Um, we should all aspire to be in work wherever we are physically and, and otherwise able to do so, because with that, with that becomes the, the freedom uh, that uh, goes along with that independence. And we know that over the course of people's lives, things can change. Um, the most recent ABS figures shows that, that the average superannuation balance for men is about 135 grand, while for women it is 83,000. Now, it's not particularly surprising that last financial year the, the labour participation rate for women was about 65%, which is 13% lower than for men. And when it comes to primary carers, the latest data shows the participation rate is 42% compared with 69% for non carers. Now, my point is here is that women will will be faced with many disruptions to their working lives. And that means they are not in a position necessarily to hit the same targets because of the way concessional caps and other things operate. But the same is true for carers. And this has been a consistent theme in, in my own local electorate work. People who, sometimes on quite high incomes, will find themselves dealt that terrible blow and find themselves as a carer in their mid-30s or 40s or 50s. And uh, they will return to the workforce at some point, but then they'll be treated like any other person saving for their retirement and subject to the same concessional caps and everything else. And so that doesn't strike me as a particularly flexible system. And while the government has made no announcement on these things, what I'm simply seeking to do by drawing that issue out is to highlight the lack of, in, the lack of flexibility that is one of the problems that we have to address in what we're now considering. And of course, all ideas will be carefully reviewed and considered but it's clear that tax incentives for superannuation must put those Australians at risk of not being in independent in retirement in a much stronger position. Another important part of all this is the government's plan to boost choice uh, in, in, the, uh, in the superannuation system. Uh, we recently responded to the financial systems inquiry and the government is taking action to ensure that it is easier for right, retirees to access retirement income products that better meet their needs. And to that end, the government will facilitate trustees of superannuation funds uh, pre-selecting comprehensive income products for retirement for their members. 
Uh, the pre-selection of these products will help guide members as they approach retirement and also help retirees achieve higher incomes through their retirement. And meanwhile, when it comes to choice, we agreed to extend choice of fund arrangements to more employees by removing the deemed choice for certain enterprise agreements and workplace determinations. This, this might be an outrageous notion, but I think the superannuation scheme and the way it's structured uh, through the government should actually be there to help the people who are saving, uh, not to help the funds that they're investing in. Um, this is what it should be about. It should, it's your money, and we want to ensure that you have the choice and the guidance and the support to make the best choices for you and your circumstances, and have none of that inhibited. Uh, by whatever award you're in or having that choice made for you or, or channelled for you in a way that you're not comfortable with. You need a, a retirement savings plan that suits you and your circumstances and no one else. In closing, I want to make reference to a sermon Gordon gave where he quoted 1 Corinthians. And he said, The body is not made up of one part but of many. If one part suffers... Every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. In that passage, Paul is talking about the church, but it could also be applied to our democracy and our society as well. And I think Gordon understood that. He very much understood that. When I was a, a state director for the Liberal Party and I used to have to recruit candidates, I would try and do two things. First of all, I'd always look for what I described as a pastoral heart. The other one I try to do is I try and talk them out of it. Uh, and, and if I could talk them out of it, they weren't the person I was looking for. And the number of people who have thanked me for talking them out of it over the last 10 or 15 years is interesting. But there are others like Louise Marcus, and who would be no, well known here, who I wasn't able, I still haven't been able to talk Louise out of anything ever since, um, because she's such a strong woman. Um, they've gone on to do great things. But they've always understood that you need to look at our society a lot like we in, in churches look at our own communities and uh, Paul's letter I think bears this out. We are connected whether we are acutely aware of it or not and we all partake as Australians in each other's sufferings and joys. Nothing could be more clear than that in, in recent times when we think of the young Australians who are in Paris in recent days and our hearts immediately think of them but also then be going beyond our shores in our own Australian context and we think of the many families and the, the terrible grieving and anxiety that would have fallen upon those families in recent days and our response is a very human one. It's a very natural one. It's a very positive one in the most terrible of circumstances, our common humanity. So we are connected and that's why it's so important that we care for people in need and why our welfare system must do what we need it to do as efficiently and as effectively as it can and as sustainable as it can. It must be sustainable or it's not a safety net. It's unreliable. It must offer choice and flexibility. It must meet the needs of people um, if it's there to serve them. And otherwise, it's just a, a very expensive sop to our collective conscience. This is not what the government wants to see. We want to change how we look at welfare so it is more innovative, so it embraces choice, that it's sustainable and it empowers people doesn't hold them and trap them in a life of dependence. Australians deserve a system that does that, that not only treats people fairly, but also builds their capability and encourages them to work. And when the time comes for them to retire, they can enjoy their independence. That is without doubt what a welfare system, a better welfare system should be in the 21st century. And so let me end by thanking again, Wesley, uh, for inviting me here tonight and to the Moyes family and, and for all of you coming out to be here. Gordon was a man of action. He was unafraid of change and always seeking the best outcomes for those he was seeking to serve. And we can all do well to follow his example. Thank you.